Now, may I please request Professor Buiz to deliver his keynote address? And I'm going to be talking about linking agriculture and nutrition at the conference. But I wanted, as long as I was going to be in India, I wanted to come to Delhi and uh, engage with stakeholders in, uh, you know, in improving nutrition in India. And biofortification is one of the one of the strategies. And um, it's really a great opportunity to engage with so many stakeholders here today. Okay, so the. Um, the first thing I want to I want to try to um, give some background on what's been happening in agriculture to provide the context and and what I'll say is uh, very much in line with uh, what Dr. Asthana um, just presented. But um, I've been advocating for biofortification since 1993. And, uh, and even 10 years ago, in 2003, the atmosphere was very different uh, when working in nutrition. So the, you know, the, the rectangle on the left sort of shows that the reason, the reason that we have mineral and vitamin deficiencies is because agriculture and the food systems aren't providing the minerals and vitamins that uh, the people need. So there's a gap. And I think 10 years ago, even, the both, uh, well, first of all, the nutrition community were very uh, excited about trying to close the gap through supplementation and fortification, and they really didn't look to agriculture as part of the solution. And by the same token, the agricultural community really fo were focused on reducing poverty, um, increasing employment, uh, making sure there was enough dietary energy in the system, and they weren't focused on minerals and vitamins. And they said, well, that's the, that's the job of the nutritionist to worry about iron deficiency, vitamin A deficiency. It's not, the, it's not the role of agricultural policymakers to worry about that. So the, the two communities really weren't talking to one another, weren't interacting with one another. But I'm, I'm happy to say that the after is really the situation today. The, the communities are working together. Um, we do need to increase the supply of minerals and vitamins through agricultural policies agricultural programs. The nutrition community recognizes that. But we're never going to completely close the gap through agriculture. We still, we still need supplementation, fortification, these types of programs uh, to, to really meet the whole problem. So we really have to work together, and I think we're, we are working together today. So it's a, much, it's a much better atmosphere now today than before. So I want to I give some background on what's been happening in agriculture. Um, so what this slide shows is really kind of a, the story of the green revolution. You, that, that dashed line through the middle of the diagram is a 100 percent increase between 1965 and 1999. And that blue bar shows that developing country populations uh, doubled uh, during that period. I don't know how to turn this one off. Just click here. Okay, there we go. So the de developing country population doubled. Um, okay. Okay. So what the <laughs> what the orange bars show is that the um, the cereal production grew faster than population. We had the green revolution. We had yield increases in in wheat and rice. Uh, but what I really want to draw your attention to are the orange bars, and it's, it's pulse production. I'm not just talking about pulse production. That's just a marker for vegetables, fruits, all, all types of non-staple foods. Production increased. Production increased by 25 percent, but it didn't keep pace with the, uh, with the population growth, with the demand. Okay. So what happens, what happens to food prices when, uh, for one type of food, supply increases faster than demand? For another type of food, supply increases slower than demand? Well, this, this, is, some, this is some data on price indices for India. And this is what happened to the price of rice. And this is all adjusted for inflation. So between the early 70s and the, the uh, 1990s, the rice prices fell by 40% because you had this big increase in supply. But you didn't continually have these rapid increases in yields, and so the, the pace of growth 
uh, slowed down, and you see the rice prices started going back up. They didn't go back up as high as they were in the 70s, but they went back up a bit. And there were certain years where they really spiked quite a bit, and we heard, we heard a lot of talk about you know, rising food prices. Um, but again, what I really want to talk about is really the next slide, and this, this is really what uh, Dr. Astana was talking about. You've seen in the non-staple foods, you've seen this, this continuous rise in prices, you know, since the middle 70s. So it's really, it's gone on for practically 40 years, um, a fairly steady rise in prices. So for example, pulses, pulse prices have doubled during that period. Um, uh, the vegetables is the slowest, but they, they've increased by 40%. So if you're, a, if you're a poor person and your income hasn't changed and you want to improve your dietary quality, it's becoming harder and harder over time to afford the dietary quality. So even, even before you had mineral and vitamin deficiencies, and I would argue that because of these price increases, it's becoming, uh, it'll become all other things being equal, it's going to become even worse and more difficult situation. So just as a just as an example of what's happening, these are these are some data for that I we collected in Bangladesh, but it's a it's a similar situation here in India. And these the one on the left is the situation in rural populations in the nineteen mid nineteen nineties. And they're spending about two thirds of their income on food. The the green I should explain that the green represents non staple um, non-staple plant foods, and the red represents uh, animal and fish products. So the staples plus the green and the red is the total expenditures on food. The red is already a sixth of their total income, but is only providing 3% of the total dietary energy because animal products are so expensive. And then about a third for non-food. And then we simulated a 50% increase in all food prices, which is the after on the right. Well, what, what happens when you're poor and the rice price goes up? Well, what you do is you pretty much continue eating the same amount of rice because there's nothing more primary than, than keeping from going hungry. And it's the rice, it's your food staple that keeps you from growing hungry. So, but if you're spending more on rice and your income hasn't changed, you have to spend less on something else. And so you cut down on the green area and the red area, which is your dietary quality. So not only does your spending go down, but you're having to pay more for those foods. So the quantities are really squeezed. So when I hear, when I read in the newspapers about rising food prices, I don't think so much about people not getting enough rice and going to bed hungry. What I think about is that they've sacrificed, to keep from going hungry, they've sacrificed their dietary quality. And their, and their iron intakes are going down, their zinc intakes are going down, their vitamin A intakes are going down. So iron deficiency, et cetera, become even worse problems. And even your, even your non-food expenditures have to, are squeezed and have to go down. So to me, this is, this is what's going on. This is the background um, of what's been happening in agriculture. And of course, it's a great incentive to business, to private business, when they see these rising food prices, of course, are going to try to respond on the supply side. And that's, you know, that's a good thing. So with that as background, then we have these different approaches. And I'm going to talk about uh, one of the approaches, which is biofortification. I really should have labeled that agricultural approaches because biofortification is only one of many agricultural approaches that can be taken. Um, but, you know, we, we all want to see dietary diversity. That's the ultimate solution. But people's incomes have to go up quite a bit before we can, we can solve the problem completely with dietary diversity. And then the rising food prices is making that more difficult. We still need supplementation. We still need fortification. But, uh, you know, the new, the new, thing, the new uh, things that we're adding to the mix are agricultural approaches. So when I think about agricultural approaches, I like to I like to segment them or categorize them into two different, into four actually different categories. So the the first the rows in the diagram are the staple foods, which are the cereals and the roots and the tubers, 
And then the non-staple foods, which are the vegetables, fruits, etc. Those are the two rows in the diagram. And then the, the two columns are what I call indirect and direct approaches. And what I, what I mean by direct approaches is when the, when the programs as part, an essential part of the program is, is nutrition education and behavior change. Okay? The indirect approach is when you're, when you're relying on existing behavior. So, for example, when your income goes up, you tend to buy uh, better dietary quality because people naturally want it. So uh, an income increase to me is an indirect approach. When, a, when the price of a food goes down, people naturally will buy more of the food. So again, uh, lowering the price is an indirect approach. But the kinds of direct approaches are when you're actually saying you should, you, your behavior is this and you have to change your behavior to that. You have to change your perception. Well, biofortification, which is using uh, plant breeding, conventional plant breeding is one of the approaches, really falls under both columns. So you can add iron and zinc, and the, amount of the, the amounts of iron and zinc that we're adding through biofortification, it's invisible, it's tasteless. So we're piggybacking on the best agronomic varieties, the best high-yielding varieties, and hoping to capture a high percentage of the total market when we breed for iron and zinc. Now, when we do pro-vitamin A, it changes the color. So, for example, and most of our, our pro-vitamin A crops are in Africa. So, Africans eat white maize. We now have an orange maize. Africans will not eat orange maize unless you give them a reason to do it. You have to give them knowledge of the vitamin A deficiency and how they can protect their families by eating the orange maize instead of the white maize. So, biofortification really falls under both indirect approaches and direct approaches. In India, we, we're only breeding for iron and zinc, so it, it's going to tend to be an indirect approach here in India and, and also in other countries in South Asia. So um, uh, biofortification is breeding uh, using plant breeding. Um, you can also use transgenic methods or GMO methods. Harvest Plus took the decision 10 years ago when we started we took the decision to focus on conventional breeding. We decided not to go into GMOs, not to go into transgenics. So all the crops that I'm going to I'm going to talk about from here on out, it's all conventional breeding. We don't think that transgenic crops are dangerous. We didn't do it because we thought transgenic crops are dangerous. We did it because of the political barriers, uh, the fear of transgenic crops. Uh, there's so many uh, extra things you have to do to develop transgenic crops and get them out and get consumer acceptance that you don't have to worry about with conventional breeding. So we thought a better approach was to use conventional breeding. We could do a lot of, have a lot of impact with conventional breeding. So I, I just want to make that, that point first. Uh, the other, th another compared, so, so different approaches, fortification, supplementation, biofortification, everybody has their niche, uh, their comparative advantages. So a comparative advantage of an agricultural approach through biofortification is that most of your costs are up front. Most of your costs are involved in developing the first varieties, uh, getting them out into the system. So you, we have, for example, the International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines. And a lot of the research was done there. Now we have high zinc rice varieties, and we're making those varieties available to different countries around the world. And uh, some of those varieties have come to the Indian Agricultural Research uh, System, and they're being adapted to India. Uh, the same thing is happening in Bangladesh, for example. Then you don't once they're out in the system, you don't have recurring costs. So the, the economic, the benefit cost ratios are quite high because you don't have recurrent costs. Supplementation, fortification, the very high returns on investment, but you have the same costs year after year after year. Your costs never, never really change. Second reason, uh, comparative advantage of biofortification is you're starting with the smallholder farmers in rural areas. Uh, uh, fortified foods tend to work best in urban areas where people are buying processed foods. Uh, they work the, as your economies develop, they work their way into rural areas. 
The biofortified foods start in the rural areas. They work their way into the urban areas as the marketing of the biofortified crops uh, develops. So that I feel the two approaches are highly complementary in terms of the types of populations they're reaching. And then it's, uh, you know, it's very affordable, it's very sustainable. The biofortified varieties are just as high yielding as the regular varieties. This means that they'll be the same price as the uh, non-biofortified. So uh, to me, the choice is obvious if you're a consumer. Why not buy the biofortified line that's the same price? You get an extra nutrient uh, level in those products for the same amount of money. So we've, um, you're less interested in what we're doing in Africa, but I'll tell, you, I'll tell you about where we are in terms of crop releases. So we've had the orange sweet potato available in Africa now for uh, since 2007. So, um, you know, we've done a, a fair amount of dissemination of the orange sweet potato in uh, several countries in Africa. Um, the, we have a pro-vitamin A cassava that's been released in Nigeria and also in DR Congo. We have a high iron bean that's been released in Rwanda. Half of bean growing households in Rwanda now have the seeds and they're higher yielding than the beans uh, currently being grown by bean farmers in Rwanda, so they're taking off fairly quickly. Um, we have a high pro-vitamin A maize uh, that's been released, just released in Zambia, just released. We're just getting started with that work in uh, Zambia in Nigeria. Um, in, in Asia, we have the high iron pearl millet, um, which has been released in India and is currently being disseminated in Maharashtra. Um, we have a high zinc rice for uh, many years, and now we have the releases, and now we're, we're really working a lot on, on figuring out delivery. Um, I thought you might be interested in some of our nutritional efficacy trials that we've done. Um, I'll, talk, I'll talk more about iron because we're farther along on iron than we are with our other crops. But we, um, our, our principal investigator has been the same uh, person uh, Jerry Hawes at Cornell University, and he's worked with different institutions in the various countries uh, where we've done the studies. So this shows, um, for example, you can see we've done a high iron pearl millet study in India. And the high iron uh, pearl millet, it's, pearl millet is naturally high in iron, but the biofortified varieties provide more than 100% of the estimated average requirement. Um, for the school children that, that were eating the uh, high iron pearl millet, whereas the control pearl millet was providing about 40% of the estimated average requirement. Um, then they, uh, you know, they did a meta-analysis a meta of um, the different studies, and they, you know, the, the kind of the blue uh, diamond there shows the, um, the level showing improved ferritin levels from the various studies. Um, for for our high iron crops, so um, so this is this is just kind of a summary of of the I, I, I don't have time to go through all the results, but basically we've um, we've shown that we can I think the most consistent result is that we've been able to improve total body iron uh, in all the all the different studies. Um, so, um, so the final conclusion is that the iron interventions significantly increase the likelihood of resolution of iron deficiency. So when we first started in 2003, there was all sorts of controversy about whether the iron would be bioavailable because of the phytates, et cetera, but we've been able to, to pretty much put that uh, controversy behind us because of our, our, the multiple efficacy trials that we've been able to undertake. And we've really gotten quite, quite good results on the pearl millet studies here in India. Um, vitamin A, um, we're, we've done, we've shown uh, also efficacy with the vitamin A crops. Maybe I won't go into too much detail here because all of our vitamin A crops have been uh, released in Africa. Um, but uh, we, we still have a couple of efficacy trials to do, but in general we're showing uh, efficacy also for pro-vitamin A in Africa. And then the zinc, um, we're, we're just getting started on the efficacy trials for the zinc. 
Um, the pearl millet study that we did in India, we also measured serum zinc, uh, but they're just analyzing the data now. Our bioavailability studies show that a high level uh, percentage of zinc is absorbed. Um, we have two high zinc wheat efficacy trials that are just getting underway now in India. So we will, it'll be a year from now before we have the uh, final results on, on the uh, efficacy trials for the high zinc wheat. And then the high zinc rice uh, efficacy trial, the first one will be undertaken in Bangladesh, and that won't start until next year. So we, we pretty much have complete results on iron, uh, already most of the evidence in on vitamin A with positive results, and we don't yet know how the uh, zinc trials will turn out, the efficacy trials, but the bioavailability studies have come out very well so far. Um, again, I won't, uh, I won't go into the adoption of orange sweet potato in, uh, in Uganda and Mozambique. It's probably less interesting uh, to this audience. But we were able to show, we, we did a, a pilot study uh, where we introduced orange sweet potato to 24,000 households in Uganda, Mozambique. We had intervention villages, we had control villages, we did baseline studies in both types of villages. We did an end line uh, survey after two years. And the bottom line is that the serum retinols in the, uh, in the intervention villages improved as compared with the control villages. And both the Mozambique and Uganda studies were published in, uh, you know, in major nutrition journals now. And it's, it's recognized as one of the most rigorous set of studies that shows that agriculture can, uh, can improve uh, uh, vitamin status. So we've um, uh, kind of, uh, now we've been able to deliver biofortified crops to more than one and a half million households. Uh, that doesn't mean they're completely, uh, have converted over to the biofortified varieties. They've just been given, you know, enough to, you know, to try it out, see what the yields are, and we'll see, uh, you know, how much the adoption holds over time. But if they're high yielding and our messages are, are effective messages, we feel that there'll be a lot of secondary uh, diffusion from these households to other households and we'll continue to do direct uh, delivery to many more households. This is just scratching the surface. One and a half million households is just scratching the surface. But if you were with us in 2003, uh, when we were just starting the breeding, it's really, it's really nice to, to know that uh, this many households have biofortified crops at this point. So we've uh, kind of, in summary, we've, we've released biofortified crops now in 27 countries, not just the target countries that I've been talking about. And we're testing, they're, they're being tested in, in total in 43 countries for, so that we can have releases in, in other countries as well. Um, let me talk a little bit about our strategies for delivery. So you really, you, really have, um, you really have strategies in terms of the supply side, trying to get farmers to adopt the varieties. And as well, you have strategies on the demand side in terms of getting both the farming families and, and consumers who are not farmers to adopt the varieties. So these are, these are some, of the, um, some of the main strategies on the supply side, trying to get farmers to adopt. So the, um, and, and to me, the overwhelming strategy is you, you have to have them in high yielding backgrounds. I've already, I've already mentioned that the, uh, the beans in Rwanda are higher yielding than the existing beans, and that's why they're really taking off in Rwanda, not because they're high in iron. Um, with the rice and the wheat and the pearl millet in India, we have to, we won't be able to exceed existing yields. We'll only be able to equal existing yields. If we do not equal existing yields, farmers will not adopt the varieties. So we have to equal, equal those yields. Um, we're really, we're really keen that, f especially for the hybrid crops, that seed companies take this on. As, as, uh, as their core business, that they develop their own biofortified varieties and market their own varieties. The uh, Nirmal Seed Company in Maharashtra has really taken this on 
now, um, and they're really involved in uh, the in the, they have their own varieties of of high iron permalit that they're that they're marketing. Um, on the uh, on the demand side, uh, when we're talking about India, the, the of paramount importance for our strategy here eventually is that we we need the biofortified varieties to be included in the in the food subsidy programs here in India. That that will create a huge demand for the products, um, and it will really jumpstart the whole process. So if the farmers know that they could, that it's e more easily sold to the public food distribution channels if they're biofortified, they'll, they'll adopt the varieties because they're just as high yielding and they know that you know, they have a ready market for the varieties. If they're not biofortified and they have a harder time selling them to the, to the public food distribution channels, they'll, they'll stay away from the non-biofortified varieties. Uh, so that's uh, that's a that's a big advocacy effort that we have to undertake. Uh, right now, we're uh, working hard on pearl millet. Um, really, pearl millet should rice and wheat are less nutritious than pearl millet, and rice and wheat are highly subsidized, but pearl millet is not subsidized. So the 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 less nutritious crops are subsidized. So that's not it. Shouldn't be that way. You should also be subsidizing pearl as well because it is so nutritious even if it's not biofortified and if it is biofortified all the better for the same price so that's uh, that's a, a big strategy on the on the supply side so I'll make a I'll make a few remarks as we you know what's the way forward for harvest plus uh, in the years ahead um, I think one of our one of our main strategies uh, for advocacy and getting uh, other institutions involved was we held the second global conference on biofortification, at the end of April, beginning of uh, end of March, beginning of April in in Rwanda. We wanted to showcase our our beans in Rwanda, and we brought in 300 uh, decision makers, people from different stakeholder groups, UN agencies, private sector, etc to um, introduce them. Some of them are already working with us, others we were just introducing the crops. Uh, M.S. Swaminathan came and uh, gave a keynote address, uh, endorsed biofortification very strongly at the conference. We had ministers of health and agriculture from that, that tandem from Nigeria, from Uganda, from Rwanda. They all endorsed uh, biofortified crops. So now we have very high level uh, endorsement of the biofortification strategy. It's not uh, kind of whether should we do biofortification or not, but they, they said now the issue is if you're not doing biofortification, why aren't you doing biofortification? We have the, we have the scientific evidence now that it works. Um, and then I'll just, I'll just uh, mention the, the types of uh, organizations that we want to, we want these organizations to mainstream biofortified crops. So we have uh, the national governments. Uh, I've mentioned seed companies. I haven't mentioned food processing companies. We're talking to food processing companies about using biofortified crops in their, in their ingredients, uh, their processed uh, food products. International NGOs, we have an MOU now with World Vision. Uh, they, we're, we're working in nine target countries, but World Vision is working in 90 countries around the world. And they want to uh, incorporate biofortified crops in their agricultural programs around the world as a way of linking their, their agriculture and health programs. So we're, we're working with them to um, give them technical advice in terms of working with biofortified crops in many other countries. UN agencies, uh, World Food Program, they have a Purchase for Progress program where they're buying locally and, and uh, storing locally purchased foods in their warehouses and they're helping farmers to improve their productivity and then guaranteeing them a market by buying their output. So they're, now they're incorporating biofortified products in that. So before they had regular beans that they were buying from, from farmers. Now they're getting the farmers to grow the biofortified beans, buying the biofortified beans and putting the biofortified beans in the, in the warehouses. And they'll, they'll also do that with the orange maize as soon as we get, we get the volumes up. And then the, and then the world banks and the, the Asian development banks, et cetera, of the world 
we're trying to get them to work biofortification into their into their loan programs. So I think I should stop there. Maybe I've gone on a little bit too long, but uh, that's kind of where we are. I'd like to. I want to make sure that Binu Cherian gets introduced. He's our he's our country manager for for our operations here. Stand up, Bino. And uh, I'll probably ask him to answer most of your questions <laughs> about uh, specifics about India. So thank you very much. Dr. Buiz, thank you so much for uh, your very wonderful uh, uh, session on biofortification. It's really very innovative, and that's something that we are looking forward to. And uh, what you quoted as Bangladesh, it is same here. Our household consumer expenditure surveys also show that uh, the expenditure of households across the board is going low and low on value-added foods like, uh, or, or not just the value-added foods, but also on non-staple foods like milk, meat, fish, poultry, fruits, and vegetables. We are spending very little. The prices are very high, and that's one of the consequences of malnutrition. So if there are biofortified crops or we have fortified foods, perhaps we would be able to bridge the gap to, a, to some extent.